Hi, welcome to week four of um, intro to critical reading. And today we're going to talk about chapter four, which was due for this week. Um, for chapter four, keeping up, she actually gets into um, some important issues that I think are going on in the country. So it says, I'm not angry so much as I'm really tired. And I don't know about you guys, but I could really connect to this. Sometimes I come off as really angry and really it's just that I'm very tired because I tend to stretch myself pretty thin. And that's something that we realize happens a lot, um, especially for people who are living in poverty and don't have a choice. Uh, they often have to have multiple jobs. They often have to um, not only do multiple jobs, but they have kids they take care of, homes they take care of, and then they're doing all this with a lack of resources. And lack of resources could be lack of money, lack of vehicle, lack of living space. So um, whenever I was reading through this, some of the things that I really um, thought was most important. Um, the first thing right out of the, the book in chapter four, it says almost nothing is more degrading than standing in a welfare line. So um, I think a lot of us can probably relate to this in some form. Even if we've never had to stand in a welfare line ourselves, we understand what it's like when we have to ask for help and we really don't want to have to ask for help, but we know we have to ask for help, even if it's not for ourselves or someone else. And then to be you know, put on display. It's not so much the asking for help, I think that she's talking about is so degrading. It's the way other people make her feel about asking for help. So um, think about it like this. How many of you have seen those videos on Facebook, Twitter, whatever, um, Instagram, TikTok, <laughs> that are basically putting on display acts of kindness? right? Where someone's videoing a person giving homeless people burgers or shoes or money or a haircut or a shower or new clothes, etc. right? This is exactly what she's talking about. When someone is down on their luck and at their lowest, yes, they need help. Yes, they appreciate it. Do they want to be put on display and made to feel um, less than for not having it to begin with? No. So this is what, this is the idea she's talking about right out the gate is that um, you don't really ever see yourself as having to be in a welfare line. But as we've found out through the other chapters, this is something that happens whether you want it to or not because sometimes just luck doesn't fall the way that we want it to and sometimes bad things happen and we have no control over them and if you already are at a lack of resources and you don't have people who can help you when you do end up falling on those hard times it's even more difficult to pick yourself back up and get back on your feet um something else that she talks about here that i thought was really interesting is She's talking about one of the hardest times in her life. And she talks about how, I'm gonna read this out loud. She says, so I get up in the morning, walk to work at about 5 a.m. and wait tables from six to about noon. I'd be home by about one, at which point I'd pass out unless I had errands to run. Then I'd get up at six, shower and fix my hair for the bar, walk three miles, 10 bar until one or two in the morning and either beg a ride from a coworker or walk home. I get home at two or three, unwind, take a short nap and start all over again. I'm exhausted just reading that. And I know you guys um, probably have had some type of experience similar to this where you just feel like you're stretched thin and you just there's not enough of you to go around right unfortunately when you're living in poverty it doesn't matter how tired you are you still have to go to work it doesn't matter you know how stretched thin you are you may still have to get another job because those bills still have to get paid that kid still has to get taken care of you know um so these are the things that i think often 
people who always lived in a means above having to struggle don't understand or recognize is that um, it's not that people who are in poverty or poor, they're conserving their energy because every single second of their day usually is consumed with trying to survive. Um, so I also enjoyed um, on page 65 where she cussed out her boss. I thought that was hilarious. I mean, who hasn't had that dream at least once where you really let them have it, boss that you didn't like? Um, but I love how she frames it in terms of her mental health, almost like, well, we have, you know, mental health problems just like everybody else, but we don't get to go to the doctor and get them fixed. So sometimes I just blow up on people. And, you know, I don't think that you necessarily have to have mental health problems to be super stressed because you're stretched way too thin and end up blowing up on somebody. But nevertheless, I thought that was hilarious. Um, so she says... Um, As we go further into it, um, she says, regardless of our mood, this is on page 68, we're never fully checked into work because our brains are taken up with at least one and sometimes all of the following. One, calculating how much we'll be, we'll make if we stay an extra hour. Two, worrying we'll be sent home early because it's slow in theorizing how much we'll lose. Three, placing bets on whether we will be allowed to leave in time to make it to our other job or pick up our kids. Meanwhile, we spend massive amounts of energy holding down the urge to punch something after the last customer he called us an idiot. People don't have any compunction about insulting service workers, but it's amazing how quickly they'll complain about your attitude if you're not sufficiently good-natured about it. So, um, again, we're getting that same theme of not being appreciated and being... Um, just seen as basically a thing and not a person, more robot than per than human, right? Where you're supposed to lay all your feelings to the side and, um, you know, deal with whatever they've decided to put on you that week or that day. And this is impossible for almost anyone. Um, going into it a little bit further, she says, Mostly I ignore the depression. I developed a caustic sense of humor. I discovered mosh pits to vent. I listened to seriously angry music. When that doesn't work, I soothe the emptiness with terrible food and old jazz. If that doesn't work and I can afford it, I go in and see someone about getting some medicine for a few weeks. That means making appointments at any place I think I might be able to get in, assuming that I'll be turned down for service and showing up to them all until I find someone who's willing to do me a solid and give me a week or two of an anti-anxiety medicine. So this is basically her trying to figure out the right combination of anti-stress relief so that she can continue to function every day and just go to work. And fortunately, this is very sad. Um, it, and it happens a lot. Um, have health care, can't really afford to get that type of service. So the next thing that I want to talk about is the word posturing that you're going to find on page 75. So this is actually part of your journal. And um, I'm asking you to describe a time in which you've used posturing or witnessed it. And first we need to understand what is posturing. So I'm going to read this paragraph to you. Take a walk through any impoverished neighbor neighborhood. You will hear the word pussy a lot. A lot. It's just how some people talk. Suck my dick, a man will say jauntily to his friends, or angrily to his friends, or randomly to women passing on the street. Fucking pussy is a popular phrase, too, as in you're a or I need some. Street cont, and we're talking about C-A-N-T, no apostrophe, not can't as in cannot, but cont in, as in the way someone speaks. Street cont isn't something that poor Americans came up with magically a year after the pilgrims got here. It's a product of environments in which everyone's always posturing, just a bit, just in case. A lot of times it means absolutely nothing. So 
what she refers to as posturing here is think of this in terms of like your swag or the way you present yourself to people. Um, posturing is basically how do you act in front of your grandma at church versus how do you act in front of your friends on the street? More than likely, that's a lot different to you. And that's because you're posturing. You are presenting yourself in a certain way based on your surroundings. And so that's what that term is talking about. But I did want to mention that so that you could um, um, make sure that you talk about that in your journal. Uh, going back just a little bit. She talks about a friend that she has named Melissa, who is just the brightest person, most happy person ever, and then um, ends up getting accused by her son or her daughter, her child school, um, and of not doing enough for her son. And so that's what finally breaks her and the author talks about how that's sad because you know most people that she knows has already been broken and broken so long ago that when you do come across someone who's just perpetually bright and happy and sunny and nothing seems to get them down it's always really sad when you have to witness them actually um break and um unfortunately i think that's probably happened to a lot of us also we've probably known people who were very bright sunny happy optimistic is the word um and just could not get them down however something happens and then they're never the same and that's it's always devastating um so as we go back in further um, she starts talking about, you know, appearances and the way that people view people who live in poverty versus people who do not live in poverty. And um, we're probably all guilty of judging people based on their appearances as well. I know I am. Um, but she makes some good points you know when you are more worried about whether we're going to be able to eat or not this week a new pair of jeans are just not that important and first impressions are important but they're not as important as surviving so um, a lot of times there are missed opportunities for people who are living in poverty because they don't look the part they're they don't look right for the job they don't look right for um, the people that they're going to be around but at the same time those are just clothes and appearances. The same, the, the person on the inside is still the same and might be the best person in the world for the job or the coolest person to ever be around. Um, so, I want to read one of the last things she writes on page 86 in this chapter. Sure, we can beat the odds. Sometimes we climb out of it. You're reading this book by a service worker after all. But the irony of my success here is that I didn't get this chance because I worked my balls off for some asshole who thought me ungrateful for my sub-living wage. You're reading this book by me because lightning struck. Because my story went viral. And by definition, that can't happen for everyone. You can hope for your one real shot, but you sure as hell don't plan for it. It hurts too much to plan and plan again and and keep waiting for the magic day. I often like to remind people that, you know, I myself came from a crazy background. There's no reason that I should be where I'm at. Um, I started at Henderson as a janitor just to be able to pay my way through school. And I ended up being a professor there for six years. Recognize every day how lucky I am because any number of things could have happened and threw me off and I would have never recovered or might have never recovered. Lots of things did happen along the way and I was able to recover, but that's not always the case and it's not always that simple. And those people probably who wouldn't have had a different set of circumstances than I did. I always try to remind myself not to judge other people because had I been given their set of circumstances, who knows how I would have turned out. And the same could be true of any of us. So it's like she said, 
sometimes lightning strikes. But that doesn't mean we should give up hope, even though it does hurt to be let down constantly. We have to keep striving and keep hoping that lightning is going to strike and that we're going to make it out. So with that being said, some of the themes that we talk about in this is hope or hopelessness. We talk about appearances and um, society's um, stigmatism put on people in their appearances. We talked about being appreciated or depreciated by our employers and also the um, service, the services that we do for people, how they don't, uh, you know, appreciate them as well. Um, and we talked about mental health. So there's a lot of important themes going on here. Remember, themes are those main ideas the author wants us to, to remember. Lessons that they're trying to give us. <clears throat> we also saw some important symbols, right? Um, we saw some symbolism going on with the medicines that she needed and, and couldn't get. We saw some symbolism going on with the clothes that she was talking about buying. We saw some symbolism going on with, um, think back to that optimistic person who ended up, you know, losing all hope and the symbol of the school being the one, something that's supposed to provide hope, being the one to destroy it, um, which also jumps into that category of irony because remember symbols are, um, representations of something beyond its literal meaning. And irony is the contrast between what is expected and what actually happens. So um, this book is filled with symbolism, irony, themes. These are important literary devices that we can use to help us understand um, our reading and to appreciate it more and hopefully to enjoy it more so that we're more likely to pay attention. Um, until next time, I will see you next week. For next week, you should have read chapters five and chapter six. Thanks.